Shalom! <laughs> it is February 16th, Wednesday afternoon. We are picking up in Genesis, I almost said Revelation, I have no idea why. In Genesis chapter 2, we will start again really with verse 16. We're not going to go into, well actually 16, we are going into detail. Let me just preface it. What we want to say as we start to look at verse 16 in detail is that we're looking now at the first of eight covenants that we see in Scripture. Last week we went through the names of the eight covenants, so just hurriedly, not time to write, but hurriedly, Edenic, Adamic, Noahic, uh, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Palestinian, and we talked about why that's not a great name today, but look at it in the context of when it was named that, Davidic, and the New Covenant. Three are general for the whole human race. The Edenic, where we're starting, is one of those three. The last five that I mentioned are Israeli or Israel, and they relate specifically to Israel, but it does not mean it doesn't involve anyone else. Some do in different ways, but again, that was last week, and if you need more detail and you don't have uh, those, the options open of that to you, let me know and I'll help with that. <clears throat> also, if you need a copy of the Eight Covenants written out for you, let me know that too, but I believe everyone that in the usual has received. So, what we're looking at in verse 16 is the Edenic, E-D-E-N-I-C, Edenic, okay, the Edenic covenant. Remember, a covenant is a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a sovereign pronouncement by God. God in his sovereignty establishes a relationship or a, a responsibility, maybe I can even say, between himself and then whoever it's directed at. It can be to an individual, it can be to mankind in general, it can be to a nation in particular, or it can be even to a specific human family. But God will make it clear in each of these covenants, as, and we won't see all eight in Genesis, but we'll see a few of them in Genesis. This one obviously was in relation to all of the human race, but right now we've got a whole two people. <laughs> so the human race as it would continue though is under this Eden Edenic covenant until it ends. Okay, now, each covenant is going to end with human failure. Failure. I can't talk today. Human failure. But that human failure never Ooh. abolishes the covenant. Mm -hmm. It's not what makes it, it doesn't make it fall apart. There's an ultimate fulfillment. Parts of it may have to be set aside. A new one may have to come in and supersede. But God's will, God's way, God's plan is never thwarted because mankind doesn't hold up to their part. We'll see that and understand that a little better, I think, as we go along. So again, in our first one, in the Edenic Covenant, we're going to say it's starting here in Genesis 2, and verses 16 and 17, but we're going to see a background of a little bit what reflecting back to chapter 1 in Genesis also, because this one is going to be a test of obedience. Um, in fact, let's just get into it, because then I think we'll understand better as we see the whole picture. So, God's going to set down sovereign responsibility. He's establishing a relationship in a specific way with Adam and with Chava, if I say her name in Hebrew, <laughs> Eve in our English, and I'll explain that as we come along. We see that God tells them, the Lord God, and remember that's Jehovah who's in covenant with the people, and God who is the strong one who keeps his covenant, who keeps his promise in those two names, but obviously when he's starting to work in covenant, he pulls in that name Lord, the all capitals in your English. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Um, let me read to you just a little bit more, and then we'll go back. Did I start in 18? That's my problem. <laughs> Forgive me. I knew it wasn't bringing out what I needed it to bring out. Let me back up before he finds out that he's alone, okay? Let's go back to verse 16, which is what I meant to read, and the name is still there, the Lord God. In fact, in 15, it's the Lord God took the man, took it on, put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. We discussed that last week. That wasn't that... It, it had problems, but it was um, Adam's joy to be working with it, nurturing it, to keep it prolifically um, reproducing and, and being, you know, 
beautifying it, okay? Now, verse 16, where I wanted to be. The Lord God commanded, okay, here's his relationship. He's putting down um, the, the commandment. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but... That's always important. Every word is important in Scripture, okay? But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Okay, so he starts off. He's put Adam into a beautiful garden setting. Variety as far as the eye can see. All kinds of trees, all kinds of shrubs, all kinds of flowers, all kinds of beauty. And he tells them, you can eat from all of this freely as much as you want no weight problem wouldn't we love it <laughs> you can eat from all of them all except one there's just one tree that they're not to eat from that means that the tree we know called the tree of life they were to eat freely from the tree of life all mankind was to eat from it God is abundantly he's profusely providing and again he's just he's showering his love on them you know how you just, you love somebody and you just gift them and gift them and gift them and gift them. Well, this is what God was doing. He so loved his creation. He wanted his creation to enjoy the rest of what he had created. So he sets up that environment for them. Then he tells them, though, there's one tree, just one, that you're to stay away from. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, because of so much evidence of God's love all around them, that's all they have ever known is God's love. They've seen it in his beauty. They've seen it in his provision. All their needs have been met. They, have, they don't know what a need is. They wouldn't understand what that word is at this point. Everything is just abundantly blessing and for them and fulfilling them. They should have assumed on the basis of that, all that good, all that wonderful, they should have realized any instruction coming from God would likewise evidence his love. That this wasn't meant to be, as we would call it, mean. It wasn't meant to be, you know, let me see if I can catch you. Wow. No, this out of his love, he was saying to them, don't eat from this tree, this one. In other words, it's not good for you. All the rest is, but this one isn't. They should have, on the basis of knowing everything from God is love, should have been willing and able to obey this one commandment. There was literally absolutely no reason to disobey. No reason. Oh, you have a question? Who has a question? Rhonda. 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 Yes, ma'am. Rhonda. You have to unmute yourself? Yeah, whatever. And thank you, because I did miss it when you're bouncing them around in their <laughs> little squares, and I don't always see why do you think the tree also had good? What was what could be the good in the evil tree? Okay, that's a very good question. I think everybody could hear her. What could be the good in the tree? We know the evil of the tree. I think we have to understand, and it's coming up as we break down this verse, but I think what we have to understand is that the tree wasn't good and evil. The fruit wasn't good and evil. Oh, this fruit's good and that fruit's bad and you can't see the difference and you might grab the bad. No, it wasn't that. What it is is that there was a test of obedience. This was what was good or evil. If they obeyed, it was good. If they disobeyed, it was evil. So it's really not the tree itself. <clears throat> Poor little tree. <laughs> or big tree. But it's, it's um, and actually it's a good thing. All of this I want to bring out, um, so you may hear me repeat it because of trying to keep it in some semblance of order, but it was good that there was a test because the opposite of this would have been what we would call robotic or puppetry. That if man didn't have the freedom <clears throat> to choose, then he doesn't have free will. He's just... In essence, I see God pulling a string, and Adam does what God says. Mm -hmm. And that's what God didn't make him for. God didn't make him to be just an object that has no ability to respond to God's love. Mm -hmm. So for them to see and understand even that they have that, there had to been a realm where that could be expressed. And the realm that it could be expressed is in this test of obedience or disobedience. Mm -hmm. But God made it so easy for them. 
And that's what I want you to see is, you know, I had a professor in college once. He got up there when he was reviewing the exam with us after it. And he said, and, and when I heard him say it, I was appalled that I had felt it. It only verified it. He said, I wanted to see how many of you I could trick with this question. And I wondered how many would fall into this, this trap with this question. And I thought to myself, mm -hmm. I thought the teacher's supposed to be our friend. <laughs> the teacher's <laughs> supposed to be helping us, not trapping us or tricking us. Well, see, God didn't trap Adam and Eve. He didn't trick Adam and Eve. He really was extending nothing but love to them, but giving them the ability, because they were made in his image, to respond. They had to have that free will. Now, he didn't allow the tempter, as we call him today, to be tempting them in a way that we are today where well now I can't say that I gotta eat those words let me take that back because I can see the trap I just fell into <laughs> what I'm saying is the influence wasn't there in the garden they had the the blessing a fellowship with the Lord they were put in a perfect environment. Their needs were all being met. It wasn't that they were lacking, that they were, it was weakness in the way we tell it today, that we are. And this is where I think it's very difficult for us to think what it really was like pre-sin. But that's what we have to think. So even when we talk about Adam being alone, we've got to understand that in a different way because there was nothing lacking. So, and I'll explain it as we get to it, but that's what I'm trying to bring us into. And again, because all we know is sin, we're born into sin, and we have a, a, a mind that is not perfect. We want the mind of, as the scripture says, Christ Jesus, Messiah, Yeshua, in us. And we're being conformed to that mind, but we only really know and understand from a sinful perspective because that's we were born into that we didn't we weren't born and, and one day decided oh okay here's my first sin and cross the line look at look at little ones look at a young toddler they know the word no before they know the word yes they have obstinate attitudes they show their little personalities my niece has our first next generation little one and I remember when this one was maybe, I'm going to say maybe seven, eight months old, they put a little toy down by her for her to play with. And she backhanded that with attitude. <laughs> her mom even said, excuse me. <laughs> you know, it was a shock. But I mean, we're born with that. We're born with that sin nature. Adam and Eve were not. And this is what I'm trying to bring us into. And, and as well as I can, I just want you to see Everything was set for them. And this tree didn't have a magical substance to it, a, a fruit that would give them that knowledge. It wasn't the, the fruit, it wasn't eating it that, that was making them um, no good and evil. The action is what's going to bring them experience in evil. But it's not the fruit that did it. The fruit was, was fine. God created it tree you created the fruit okay so he put Adam and Eve in that garden in their innocence if you remember my chart my big chart room size chart that we showed the seven different periods of time we started with the innocence Adam and Eve were innocent they didn't have any knowledge of evil I can't imagine that I think how wonderful that would be to not know evil. <laughs> they only knew good they only knew good coming from God they only experienced good but to disobey him, to choose to eat the fruit which showed their disobedience, that would give them experiential knowledge. They would literally experience evil. They would experience wrong. They would now have a moral responsibility for their future actions. That wasn't there prior. Yes? Well, you know, the way I see it, because God knows obviously, uh, the good and the evil. Yes. So, by, by disobeying, that means that they were not, they were not listening, you know, to what, that the uh, recommendation that the Lord did. 
and more than a recommendation. It, it, the equal it, it is a commandment. Command. Yeah. Do not. Yeah, do not. Do not eat from that, from this tree. Right. And then that's why also if we think about the serpent, he said, you will become like God. Yeah, because God knows good and evil. <laughs> Have you read my notes? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, You're down a little ways, but yeah. yeah. So the way I see it is that God made them seeing good. Yes. <laughs> Yes, but, but not evil. right, right, exactly. He he made them seem good and being good, but they chose when they disobeyed to learn experientially firsthand what evil is, what wrong is, and they learned there are consequences to those actions. And even in your words too, I hear Maria. When we get down to law, and we won't get to that, um, that comes in, in Shemot, in Exodus. But when we get to the, to the law, God commanded, well, he commanded them here. And it's the same thing. They had to not just hear it, but they had to obey it. And so many times we get that in Exodus with, with our children of Israel. Oh, all you said, we'll do it. And God said, oh, that they'd have a heart to hear and obey. Because he knew. He knew what they were going to do. Um, and really, I think we're all at fault there to this day. We hear and we want to obey, but unfortunately, as Adam and Eve learned experientially, we also learned experientially. I know someone who used to give her testimony for a Christian businesswoman, and she would tell that she was the youngest of four or five girls, I don't remember, but she was born with the strongest willful uh, for herself attitude out of all the kids. She, she, they said her first word was no. <laughs> and she said that her parents said, good, because at an early age she'll know and understand her need for her Savior. So they took it as that positive because she'd know the wrong of her actions and her attitude. She would know the need sooner. Would to God that we all would respond in that way. Okay, so <clears throat> we see that they're going to become experienced. They say experience is a great teacher. In this case, it was not. <laughs> okay? And here is, as we go on in the verse, and we'll keep talking about all of this, um, and I've got to read 16, not 18. I think my eyeballs need a little help. Um, okay, <coughs> from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. Okay? Um, there we go. I'm on it. I'm sorry. I was in for 17. Didn't realize. From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. This again was the commandment showing you were free moral agents. They were free to decide, I'll go with God and with his plan, which is all love, all wonderful, all fulfilling, no lacking, or they would choose to go against what he is saying. But it wasn't an accidental going against. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, because we're going to see that they do something very common to humankind all the way down to today, and that is blame somebody else. But we'll get there. We're not there yet. He gave them the consequence. If you eat, what will happen? If in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. We started to hit on this last week also that the Hebrew says, dying you shall die. If they ate from that tree, they would die spiritually immediately. They would be in need of a spiritual redemption, a, a spiritual new birth, because they have just died spiritually. Physically, it would come ultimately. It would not come immediately, but it would come ultimately. Rejecting God's word, and that's what they're doing. They're rejecting God's word. It would... In essence, they were rejecting his love, too. And it would put a barrier up between God and man that he had created. And that would be a separation. That's why it was an immediate spiritual death. Because now there was a wall between God of love and the spirit that he had given to them and where they are themselves. <clears throat> From that time forward, the body begins to decay. They never would have known decay. When you wake up tomorrow morning and you've got those aches and those pains... When you hurt, when you have to have surgery, when you cut a toothache or whatever's going on, you can say, thank you very much, Adam and Eve. <laughs> because of you, I have these aches and pains. But the body eventually would return 
to the earth, to the what it was formed from that we talked about last week. Um, and how do I know that? I cheat. I look ahead. Chapter 3 and verse 19, the second part of it, says, uh, because from it you were taken, oh, well, I guess I have to start. Let me read the whole verse of 19, but my point's in the second part. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. How many have heard those words at a gravesite? Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. And they're commending or committing the body back to its creator in their words. But basically what they're admitting in those words is God made them out of the earth and they're going to go back to the earth. The body decays to that point. It's just minerals and it goes back into its original state. That's what would happen. Um, Okay, I think I've got that. So let's go back. Let's go to verse 18. I think I have covered 17 well now. Yes, we've decided, we understand that that dying is dual. Spiritual immediately, physical will follow. Verse 18, then the Lord God, again showing us he's the God of covenant who is going to keep his promise in relation to man. He said to uh well, he is recorded his saying, and by the way, let me preface it by reminding you, chapter 2 is not chronological. We're going to jump around. Chapter 1 was chronological. Chapter 3, we'll see, goes on again too. But chapter 2 jumps around because the point of it is to put emphasis on certain points. So, now we're jumping to the point where the Lord God said it's not good for man to be alone. Now, that doesn't mean it was evil for man to be alone. We're not saying good, evil. You know, the opposite. What it means is Adam, in his aloneness, there was an incompleteness, it, there was an unfinished. God shows him this in all the other animals. All the other animals that he created, he created male and female, just like he created male and female in his image. Genesis 1.26 told us that. God made both man and woman in his image. Well, it, and Genesis 1, 22 and 24 also. Look at those verses later because we went over them well when we were there. Man was the only creation that God made. Okay, how do I say it? Because we know the animals were made first. Now God's made man, but he hasn't made a woman yet. This is the only pause here. He didn't do that with the animal life, with the fishies in the sea, with the birds in the sky. Okay, they all were made male and female, and we read that in those verses that, that I've given you. Now, I don't want to imply for a moment that Adam had years alone, <laughs> because I believe it was on the very day, and I'll show you why I believe that as we go on. When God created Adam, Adam, he created him, and he, how do I say it? He knew, because God knows it all. He knew, he, and, and I don't want to use the word immediately, but from the beginning, I don't know how else to say it. We have to talk about time because we're confined to time. But bless you. But he knew that Adam was alone, and he knew Adam needed a companion. He needed a helpmate, and so he did create Eve for Adam, okay? Now, the joke goes around. God made Adam, took one look at him and said, good, but I can do better. <laughs> and made Eve. <laughs> Sorry, man, had to throw that in there because there's so much against the woman coming, so I <laughs> had to throw it in there. But God did make Adam in the capacity that he needed a helpmeet, just like he made the animals. If they're going to continue on, there has to be male and female. That's the one big point that I want to ask the evolutionists. How on earth did it suddenly come together, male and female, to reproduce? This one produced the male line, this thing produced the female line, and they happen to be perfectly suitable for each other so that they could come together and reproduce in a different way from that <coughs> point forward, yet you tell me that they evolved out of this, that evolved out of that, that evolved out of that, that evolved out of that. I think, I think it was two explosions. The female explosion. <laughs> <laughs> Maria's saying there were two explosions. The female explosion and the male explosion. They're still exploding to this day. But I love Roger's shirt that says, The Big Bang Theory. God said it and bang, it happened. <laughs> That's right. I like that one. Okay, so 
God's making Adam in such a way that he, he's, he needs Eve for completeness. And if God didn't make him lacking, but he made him, oh, how do you say it? It's so difficult because we're just so confined. <laughs> but he made him where he'll be completed in Eve. I'll put it that way, okay? It was God's intention from the beginning. God didn't make Adam. Adam blew it, or Adam, you know, came up to God one day and said, hey, I need somebody. No, 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 no. This was all God's plan. It was God's perfect plan. Maybe the Hebrew helps me because the Hebrew, when it says uh, be alone, that it wasn't good for man to be alone, the Hebrew really says in his separation. And I think maybe that helps us understand he was separated. Here all the animals have their companion. Adam was made, and there isn't that companion right there immediately, but yet, 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 very, very quickly. It's like I say, I'll prove to you why I don't believe there was time in between. When it says made um, a helper suitable for him in NASB, you may have the old English meat for him, fit for him, whatever word you're using, the idea is suitable. The idea is corresponding. Um, like a helper would be to man. In other words, man's not going to be made complete in a dog or an elephant or a whale or a bird in the sky or anything else. His completeness is going to need something suitable to him, something in, in a likeness of him, comparable, okay, comparable to him. God's blueprint. God's blueprint for creating this companion was to make this companion a helper comparable to Adam. Okay, hold on to that thought because we're going to get into the depth of male and female. We're going to get into whether one's better or one's lesser. All of this that sin has taken for a ride through time in Oi, where we are today. That's why I want to go back to the Hebrew. God didn't develop it this way. Sin developed it this way. This helper, this meet, this one who would be suitable, who would be adapted um, to completing Adam, is a companion that would be suited to his needs. The dog had different needs than the human had. The fishy in the sea has different needs than the dog has. The bird in the air has different needs. Adam had specific needs. When we get in reference to the marriage relationship, we will see on the basis of God's creation and the way he created male and female, that God created the woman to be perfectly suitable helper to man. God gave a plan to man, to Adam, and then he gave Adam, Eve, to help him complete that plan, okay, to carry out that plan. Now, they were to work together to fulfill the plan. In essence, we're saying God gave the responsibility of something to Adam, and we'll talk about it as we come through it, the accountability to the man for that. And then he gave man, the woman, and he gave her the responsibility and the accountability to help him do what he was to do. So they're compatible, comparable, and they're coming together. When you look at the Hebrew for the helping, and when you get into the original meaning here, that helping is not a position of inferiority. That's how we look at a helper today. We think, oh, the helper's secondary. The helper is less than. We've got a big one, and then we've got a helper. We talk about our best supporting actors and actresses in our movies. That's not how God made Adam and Eve. He didn't make Adam to be, here's your main actor, and then here comes Eve, here's your supporting actress in a lesser role. No, God made them to come together to be the woman to complete the man in the responsibility that man was to have before God. You think there will be equal responsibility to e each other? Equal responsibility, and I like that, to each other also. Very good, very good, yes. Again, the world's mindset is different. What's God saying? God considers a position of helping, a position of serving, of the utmost importance. Let me take you to the prime example. Go with me to Matthew 20 and notice who is going to be the helper in this. Don't miss that because there will never be a better example. Matthew, what? Matthew 20 
and we're going to look at verses 25 to 28. Matthew 20, Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28. But, here's another but in scripture, never miss the buts, <laughs> okay? I've lost my people, are they there, Roger? Yes. Okay, as long as I know they're there. Okay, but, Yeshua Jesus, notice who's, who <clears throat> the character is. Yeshua Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their great men exercise authority over them. It is not the way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as, and here's his prime example, just as the Son of Man, Messianic title, fully God, fully man, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. There's your servant. Now, is anyone going to say the Lord was in a lesser capacity, an inferior, under? No. No. And how did he show it? He showed it, if you want a, a picture, he washed his Talmudim's feet. Mm. That was the position given to a servant to do. It was not given to the king to wash the feet of the men who came into his presence, no. But the Lord stooped down and washed their feet. He showed servanthood in everything he did and ultimately in laying down his life that they might have resurrected life in the power of his resurrection. That's the servant. That's the helper. That's what we're seeing here. It is not a lesser than. In fact, if anything, I'd almost say it's a greater than. But I'll leave it equal because in humankind it's equal. Eve, then, was to be considered and honored. Mm, don't miss that word. Honored as such. A woman, eventually a wife, as we go on, if they stayed in this level, should never have been seen as a mere tool, a mere, mere worker, a mere help in that sense, but should have always been seen as an equal partner, an equal partner human being. Male and female, he created them. And he created them both in his image. We'll say more as we go on, but I think I've said enough for here right now. So back to Genesis 2. Uh, back to verse, I think we're in 18. I should mark it, but I don't know how to. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Lord showed Adam that, well, he's telling him, I will make a helper suitable for him. So, God's going to do it. Like I say, time doesn't pass. I'll prove my point, but let's read verse 19. <clears throat> Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. Well, how many of you just got thrown for a loop? Wait a minute. I thought the animals came first, and I thought we were going to see Eve being created. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we're not in chronological order. So we're told God made a dome needing this suitable help meet. But then we're told how Adam found out. So we go back to the fact that God made all the animals, and he made them male and female, as it said. And we're going to see that that's going to show Adam something. So let's read with that in mind. Keep reading it. Uh, by the way, the Hebrew makes it very clear. The Hebrew says... Out of the ground the Lord God had formed. It's not that it's just happening now at this moment because then we would have to say, well, wait a minute, Genesis 1 tells us animals and the man. Genesis 2 is telling us man and then animals. No, Hebrew makes it very clear. When we're getting about man, it's like the writer realized, I need to go back and explain it to you from seeing it in the animals and then bring it back to man. So that's all he does in verse 19. He brings that back, but it also shows us something about Adam. And by the way, when it says to the man, the word in the Hebrew is Adam. We say Adam. And it means literally red. That's the name given to the earth in modern Hebrew. It's called Adam, red earth. Okay, that's, that's just the Hebrew. And it's the first time man's called by a name. Until this point, he's been called man. 
But in our Hebrew, which you don't see in your English, or at least you, I don't in my English here, in our Hebrew, we're now introduced to him being called Adam. Adam. And again, just simply meaning red out of the earth. Okay, so he, he made, um, they were all made, he made beasts, birds, brought them to man, to Adam, to see what he would call them. Okay, God brought them. That gives us the idea, because we know the garden is only part of the earth, that the garden, we looked at it being in the Fertile Crescent probably, we looked at, at it being very large, not a little house garden. <laughs> we saw a very large area, but it wasn't the whole earth. God made the garden eastward in Eden. So when we say Garden of Eden, we're almost, it is of Eden because it's of the earth, but it's not the whole earth. So it sounds like this, if God brought the animals, it sounds like the animals are living over the whole face of the earth, and God brought them to Adam to name them, the same way when we get down a few chapters, take us a while, but we'll get there, and we talk about Noah and all the animals that God brought to him to put into the ark. We know that it was two of every kind, and we know that it was a miracle that they came to him and went on to that ark. They didn't all just live right around that ark. Mm -hmm. And that's what the idea we're getting here is that animal life was throughout the earth. And so God miraculously brought them into Adam's presence for Adam to name them. Because it says that he brought them to see what the man, what Adam, would call them. And whatever he called them, that's what it would be. This tells us Adam was made bright intellectual. He had knowledge, uh, well I shouldn't say knowledge, but he had ability. He had a mind that worked. I won't say anything about our sin-soaked <laughs> minds today. Yeah, I think he, he had understanding. Yes, More yes, knowledge. yes, that's a better way to put it. He had understanding mm -hmm. and he had ability to use that understanding. Now, apparently this all was done on the sixth day. Because the six days when God created humankind, and on the seventh day God rested and he had finished all his creation. We don't pick up with day eight, he went on and created Eve. Okay? So Eve had to have been formed on the sixth day also. Here's my proof that this all happened in one day. God was busy on the sixth day. Made all the animals that, that were to be on the face of the earth and moved right into creating man. And then when he's created man, breathed into him, he's become a living soul, he brings him and shows him the creation of the animals to see what man's going to call him. So in the first little bit of Adam's life, he's acting, he's got capacity, he's got brilliance. You ever tried to name? How would you like to name 50 kids? <laughs> Now try to do something that, that differentiates everyone. In our English, you know, we say dog and cat and, and bird. Well, I can't even say bird. Sparrow and eagle and, and yeah, I should have said, I guess, golden retriever and, and uh, corgi for the sake of shadow and, you know, all of these. But Adam had that ability and apparently was able to very quickly. I don't think it took him, oh, I've used up everything I can think of which for any of us who've tried to create and work with anything, I used to uh, make candles. We would put layers of colors on these candles. The way that we did it would make each one a different pattern. And you'd try to create new patterns and you'd run out of, well, I've done that before. And you'd repeat and every once in a while you'd get oh, an aha moment and, oh, I got a new design or a new color because of the blends, you know. But a dome didn't run out of creativity. It shows the kind of mind, but remember he was made in the image of God who created it all. You ever thought about that? What did God not make? <laughs> we have no clue. But look at the variety. Oh, I could go on and on and on, but I don't want to beat it to death. Um, and by the way, his resting on the seventh day with all creation completed, we saw that in chapter 1, verses 27 and 28 and 31. So if you want to go back and refer to that later, there you go. So again, just reminding you, chapter 2 is not chronological. When he brings Eve to Adam, because he's created Eve, 
we're going to see, in fact, let's take that sneak peek because it helps us understand a little better. Let's go to Genesis chapter 5 just for a moment because it will be a while before we get there. <laughs> Genesis 5 and verse 2, Bereshit chapter 5 verse 2, talks about what we're talking about right now. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them, and your English again will say man, but actually it says and named them Adam. And the way we would say it today is he made them Mr. and Mrs. Adam. So I'm going to put that in. That's my words. But he made them in the day when they were created. Now, did you notice what I just said? In the day they were created. If he created Adam on one day and Eve on another day, I would think to be exactly right, it should say in the days they were created. But he made them in the day they were created. They were created in the same day. So all of this, I think, is very quick in succession. Adam is introduced, as we go back to chapter 2, he's introduced to um, all the, the animal life and all that has partners. And he sees he does not have a partner, so he understands stands that he is separate. And in that separateness, we use the word alone. There's not a suitable helper, nothing comparable to him. And he saw that very quickly because he's bright. He's seeing, you know, where is my <coughs> missus? I see Mr. and Mrs. Dog and I see Mr. and Mrs. Bird, but where's my missus? So he realizes, I think, quickly on that he needs this suitable help me. And that's what we come back to. Verse 20, the man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. Again, you might have the words meet or fit, okay, but suitable. The Hebrew word again is showing an equality, it's showing alongside. There wasn't anybody alongside with Adam. So the Hebrew is in essence describing almost that there needs to be a stronger party supporting the one in need. Now, because we're prior to sin, we're, we're not, we don't have needs like we have today. But again, what we're seeing is Eve was created to be added strength to fill Adam's need. His, I, I, I have to call it a weakness, but it's not meant he's weak, she's strong. Okay, I don't mean it that way. But Eve's got to be created to be comparable and to be a completer, to be a co-worker, to be a co-regent, to have the same rights and the same privileges. You don't see God say, Adam, you live by these rules. Eve, you live by these rules. Man, again, does that today. We've had, really, for, for the woman, she's had to fight for some of the rights that, that should be hers, not that I'm out to the extreme. I'll leave that. I think you understand. But the woman and the man would supplement each other. They would fulfill each other's needs. They would complement. They would. It, it brings it to one whole. And that's what we're going to see. It brings it to one whole. So God made man and woman as equal partners. Both made in his image. Both made in his likeness. So they acted that way. They lived that way. They loved that way. They interacted with God that way. There wasn't strife. There wasn't aggressiveness. There wasn't a domineering attitude. There wasn't a struggle for preeminent, I'm better, I'm best, I'm first, you're second. None of that before sin entered. All of that comes with sin. God gave them orders. They were to obey. Guess who's had? God. Here's man, male and female. Here's God. God was the head, not man. One person, male or female alone, was not enough to give us the image of God. They were made both in His image. There are male qualities that re reflect God. There are female qualities that reflect God. And I think the best way that I've heard it phrased, it's the mother love of the Father God. Okay? They're both there. So the, the, what we see in male and female today that's good, not the sin, but the good, is reflecting our God is too big to fit in one. That, that's what we're saying. He is ineffable, my favorite word, and he couldn't confine everything of his image in just the male 
nor in just the female. That is the two complete, uh, uh, there's a oneness in it. We're seeing the oneness of our God, who also is exemplified him, his very self in a triunity. We have to see a God the Father, a God the Son, and a God the Holy Spirit to understand God. Yet they're not three separate, yet they are, but they're three in one. Now, anybody fully understand that? Because you can go to the head of the class. <laughs> and if you can teach it better than I, I'll sit down and take a seat and I'll listen to you because as far as I'm concerned, I will never fully grasp that until I'm home. Any more than I can grasp that God is from eternity past. Past what? I don't know. But past that. <laughs> and we all will join him in eternity future. That's amazing. But again, would I want God on the level of this human? Oh, no. And if we did have that, God helped the entire world. <laughs> So, God has shown Adam his need. God is going to complement him. God is going to fulfill him. God's going to complete him. And we have that in verse 21. We have in verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. That kind of sounds like the first anesthetic ever given. And it wasn't given in a shop form. And it wasn't given through drugs. <laughs> but God put Adam to sleep. Now, it wasn't necessary to prevent pain because we don't have pain yet. Mm -hmm. So even though God's going to surgically work on a dome, he's not going to know the knowledge of pain and the knowledge of suffering. That came into the world with that judgment. Thank you very much, Eve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what we're given, and why I believe God did it this way, is absolutely amazing. This is a profound spiritual picture. I want to take you to see it in the spiritual rather than in the physical now. Messiah Yeshua Jesus Christ is called the second Adam. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15.45. Let me, let me prove my point right up front. 1 Corinthians 15.45. 1 Corinthians 15.45. Okay, I'm in chapter 15, running down to verse 45, where we read, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. We're studying that well. He is alive, he is a living soul. Then it says, The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Well, obviously, we're not talking about the last person who's been made, because people are still being made. And this one that we're talking about, that we're calling the last or the second Adam, this one has ability to give the life-giving spirit. Remember, Adam didn't come alive till God breathed into him, so we're talking about the breath of God in this one who brings to life. That means that this is only God himself, and we see him personified in the second part of the triunity, the Son of Man. And I use that name again because that's Messianic, showing he is the Son promised, which means he existed from all time. Micha, Micah 5, 2 says that he came from eternity past, in essence, in the words that it says. He came from days of old in your English, but really in the Hebrew is eternity past. The Son came. The child was born. When he's called the Son of Man, he's taken on that human form, that human part being born, but the, the Son part being God, always there. He then is the one who has life-giving abilities to us. And it gives them to us in the third part that we see in our one God, the Spirit. The Spirit breathes life into us. All three parts took part in our creation. We're seeing it all here. So, knowing now that Yeshua Jesus is called the second Adam, and he's called that because he's the one that took on human form. He, he was created, his body was created, Adam's body was created. I think you understand what I'm trying to say. So, what we see is the second Adam who, through death, obtains a bride. When Yeshua died on the cross, rose from the dead, so he conquers the wages of sin, which is death, he can give that gift of life, eternal life, to any and all who will accept his perfect shed blood in their place. 
we know that each one who becomes a believer, who accepts the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus for themselves, becomes a part of his body. The way we refer to it is that we are the bride of Christ, the bride of Messiah. So out of Yeshua's death, he is able to have a bride. He brings the bride to life. Now, keep thinking that. We're going to come back to that. We're not running away from it. I love this picture. God had to explain to Adam what was going on. When he put him to sleep, he had to explain to him clearly what he was doing and what had gone on when he formed Eve. Because we're going to see that as we go on. Let me keep reading because i got so much to share. I, I, I want to explode it all over, but I want to try to do it in, in an order that will make sense according to what we're reading here. So I've got some thoughts to complete. I've left them dangling. We'll cover them right in these next verses. I am in verse 21. He made God cause a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. I'm thankful he did sleep through it. <laughs> okay. Then he took, God speaks, being God, God took one of his, Adam's ribs, and closed up the flesh at that place. Now, all kinds of arguments out there, I'm going to cut through red tape. The word in Hebrew is selah, and it means ribs, okay? Now, it can be translated side, or corner, or chamber, or a flank, like when you see an animal and it's a flank, it's a side of that animal. It can be. Twenty times in the scripture it is translated side. It's used 41 times in scripture with those other words I just gave, and it's used as rib right here. Okay? Now, a side was the difference between a side and a rib. A side would include flesh and bone. And since we see that's what happened, if you take a sneak peek down at verse 23 in chapter 2, you'll see that, that Eve was made out of Adam's flesh and bone. So it sounds like even though we translate it rib, and there's a reason why we do here, that side is also accurate. When we try to split hairs and divide, we get into trouble. It's a rib, it's part of his side, it all works together, okay? So, uh, and by the way, in this process also would be blood, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. We see that in Viagra, Leviticus 17.11. Let's go there. Critical verse, even for our salvation, but especially when we're sharing with our Jewish people. Leviticus 17 and 11, and we read there, the beginning of the verse, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. So in that flesh is life-giving blood. If our people, our ancestors, would have read the Word of God, George Washington went and died when he died. They took his blood from him. They leaked his blood out. The blood was his very life. They were bringing his death on instead of helping him live longer because of their misunderstanding at that time. Okay, I'm going to let you read the rest of the verse on your own, uh, but know that, that God says, I've given you the blood on the altar for the remission of your sins. That blood we know is Messiah's. But staying just to our thought here that the life of the flesh is in the blood, now go back to Genesis 9 and verse 4, and we're going to see also that we're told very clearly there, only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And then it goes on and tells it what, that he will require blood if you... If you spill blood, blood is required of you. But did you catch that, that the, the flesh with its life is the blood? This is why to be kosher, they drain all the blood out because they can't eat the blood because that's life and they can't, that, that's just not kosher with God, okay? So we've got flesh, blood, life coming out of the side. All right, now let's take that back into where we were and what we're reading when God, and I'll use the word operated, on a dome and took out of his split open side. It was torn apart, it was, it was cracked, it was split open, however you want to say that. He opened up that to bring life out of that, the life that we call Eve. And I'll tell you why she's called Eve in a bit. Now, following our picture that 
Messiah, Christ, is the second Adam. When his side was torn open, when his side, the spear went in, do you remember what came out? Blood and water. And it showed the certain death had taken place. But out of that death, the Lord was bringing us life. If he hadn't died, we would be dead in our trespasses. If he hadn't resurrected, we wouldn't resurrect. We wouldn't have that life. So the picture is perfectly beautiful that out of Messiah's split side, riven side, torn open side, he gave life to his bride. His bride to life. That's us. All of us who believe. That's sometimes commonly called the church today, the called out assembly. But that's each one who believes in him. Life out of his side. What a picture. Mm. If you ever ask yourself, why did God make Eve the way he made Eve? I believe that's exactly why. Because God foreshadows all the way through scripture. He uses things to be pictures to help us understand. And as the saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm. There's so much more that we get when we see it in this. And when we now see that out of his side came life. And hang on to that. We're going to add one more layer to it in a moment. We see our second Adam out of his side comes life for his bride. Ooh, what a picture. Now, notice how specific and accurate scripture is. When the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, then he took one of his ribs. That's why it's translated rib here came out of his side, along with that rib, came flesh and blood, as we have just described. But it had to have been a rib. He only has one side. Well, he has two sides, but still, you know what I'm saying. He had, he had more than one rib. So that's why they use the word specifically that it was out of a rib. But out of that rib is flesh and blood and life that is here. And then the scripture tells us that God closed up the place. I'm trying to find it in here. He closed up the flesh at that place. Um, the Hebrew says closed up the flesh underneath. So he took something out and under it, he closed it up. There's it's your... Not, it says uh, uh, closed up the flesh in its place. In its place. Okay. Because now something has been taken out. So that's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Closed up the flesh in its place. Or at that place you could even say. But what we're seeing is God used Adam's own body to create Eve. That's forever going to be a reminder to Adam of their oneness. Came right out of her side. Adam would see their differences. They are made of the same substance because Eve's made out of the same substance that Adam was made out of. Essentially, they are more alike than they're different, but they are going to see differences. But as one author put it, how is red equal to blue? Only in the essence that they're both colors. But that's where it ends. Red is better at being red and blue is better at being blue, but they're both colors. Or let's look at water. And you have hot water and you have cold water. In what way is one superior? You use them for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But what way are they superior? They're not. They're both the same. They're both water. So there's a oneness, a, an equality, and yet there's differences, different traits. And, you know, and, and, and both are needed. Yes. That is specific. Yes. Yeah. Both are needed. You need hot water for certain things. You need cold water for certain things. God says, I wish you were hot or cold. He doesn't like the lukewarm. He's going to spew that out. Yeah. <laughs> and we need the variety of colors, too, mm -hmm. to understand and to see. Have you ever tried to describe something to a blind person? You'll learn very quickly how handicapped you are because you can't talk to them about color. They don't know color. There's so much that they're missing, so much more that we see. And in the colors, we get those spiritual lessons also. Red forever speaking to us of shed blood. And you've gone with me through the study of the color of the rainbows. Oh my goodness, the rainbow, sorry, singular. But the rainbow being redemptive, redemptive try it again, redemption's arch. Okay, it shows redemption. 
in never-ending blessings of wonder. I look at that rainbow and it's speaking to me of, of the Lord's salvation. Wow. And when I see this picture of God birthing Eve out of Adam's side, showing that oneness, life coming out of it, being a picture of our second Adam, bringing us, we're at his side. We're birthed out of his side to be his bride, not to be under his feet, not to be a servant even at that point. We're brought up to that level of bride. And you show me a groom that doesn't adore his bride, and I'll tell you, that ain't no marriage. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> okay, so, and here, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you in a Jewish um, saying, and I love it. Eve was taken from Adam's side not from his head to be ruled over by him or even to rule over him, not from his feet to be trampled upon, but out of his side to be equal with him, a companion, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved by him. Mm. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love our Jewish things. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, while you're reveling in that, and I hope that's speaking to our men as well as to our women because we women love that protection and that love. We'll give a lot to get that. And we need in a different way now. But back to this. Um, let me put a, a myth to sleep. <laughs> Not like at home, but end it. Men don't have one less rib than women. <laughs> there wasn't an incompleteness in Adam. Remember how Yur said it in its place, like in place of instead of, he, he closed up the flesh. So no matter whether God used a rib, a rib and flesh, a rib and flesh and blood, which I believe it was because I believe to pull the rib out toward the side that brought out the flesh with it and, and the, the blood that comes along with it, we know that every cell of man contains his body's entire genetic blueprint. We know that in the cells is, is our DNA. God took some of Adam's DNA, some of his cells, some of his essence of what made him up to make the genetic blueprint for Eve. Forever a oneness, forever a closeness, a red and a blue, a hot and a cold, but the same. Both water, both colors. He made them both human. And he made them both to be the progenitor of the human race. So we have one start to the human race. We don't have two human races started, the male and the female. No, out of that male came that female, out of the same substance, breathed into by God. Because we don't read that Adam breathed into Eve and she became a living soul. And now let me tell you what Eve means in Hebrew. Chava, life or life giver. God breathed into her life and she became a living soul also. So we have the one beginning of the human race at this point called Adam. Adam, even though in our English we would say Mr. and Mrs. Adam. We've just been presented to you. Okay? <laughs> That's the marriage part of me. <laughs> um, okay, so verse 22 tells us that. The Lord God fashioned. He made, and I'll give you the Hebrew word in a moment, into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Wow. This is God. <laughs> Amazing God. He took a rib and he made a woman. He fashioned her. The Hebrew is banach. The Hebrew means he builded her, and I like that. I, I like seeing God building, you know, putting her together, because that is as special as God taking the dust and forming Adam from the earth. He also builded Eve, Chava, maybe in the same way that he formed man, because he's still using the substance of the earth, the, the minerals that, that made up man. He's just reforming it into what would be the life of the woman, and the two then are forever one flesh. And are we not? If, you, if I put down a hunk of flesh from a man and a hunk of flesh from a woman, and I asked you which is which, you'd look at me like I was crazy. They're human. 
They're both flesh. They're both one and the same. There is no difference. This is how the quality and the coming together and again completes our picture because the picture of what's called the body of Christ. He being our second Adam, the one who gives us life out of his side, he is the one. We are his body. We are builded together. And I'm saying that wrong. I know that, but I like it. It sounds better than built. It gives us that individual picture. At least it does in my mind. He built it us together, and we come into forming his body. He is the head. And we are a part of his body. Now, is this Rochelle's thought? No. This is God's thought. Let me give you backup proof. Ephesians 2, and we'll go to verses 19 and 20. When it's my thought, I'm glad to tell you, hey, I think this, but this is what God is showing us. In Ephesians 2, verse 19, it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Paul, the author, is speaking to those who have come to saving faith. They're now no longer a stranger. They're not outside of this, this household, God's household. Verse 20, having been built, here's our word, built. He built it, he built it on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit. We are part of the Lord's body. This is a closeness, a oneness, a cohesiveness that we cannot understand in any other way. I love the picture the Lord has given us. Eve came out of Adam. We come out of the side of Messiah. We're part of his body. We are builded as one. And did you notice that it's building the holy temple of the Lord? This is where the Lord dwells. This is his, his one building. This is not all over. And we're certainly not talking mortar. We're not talking stones and wood and, and somebody go get a hammer. This is what the Lord has created. This is what the Lord has made. And how wonderfully a picture, how beautiful a picture, how wonderful it is for us to realize that we are brought into that oneness through the second Adam. Wow, if that isn't amazing, that God can take dirt <laughs> and make something so beautiful. Let me give you a second witness, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want verse 12 again, verses 12 and 13, and then we'll drop down to another verse. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, For even as a body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Messiah. Okay, I get all kinds of members in my body. I got fingers, I got toes, I got a nose. <laughs> I've got all kinds, but I'm one body. Mm -hmm. And this is what Shaul Paul is saying to the, to the people. We're all making up the one body of our Messiah. There's a picture out. I, I wish I had it. I wish I knew where to get it. it. It's a picture of the Messiah. You know that's who he is. He has a... Um, like a prayer shawl covering that comes down. And you see like a side profile, but you see, you know, the body. When you get up close and you see it, you realize it's all different people's heads that are making up this whole picture. Mm -hmm. When you stand back, you see one. Mm -hmm. When you come up, you see all the little individuals. We are all part of the body of Christ. Now, you can say, well, I'm a pinky, and the other can say, I, I'm the nose. You can pick, but it doesn't matter because it all needs each other. Every part of that body is critically important, and yet to see Messiah as the head, ah, how it warms us to know we are one with him. What God shows us through the very creation of the first male and female who we come out of also. Drop down to verse 27 in that chapter. Now you are Messiah's body and individually members of it. 
So even though we come together and form one, we are individual. Each one has to come in. That's a chad in our Hebrew, and I'll bring that out in a moment, but I want to answer Rowena's question first. She's trying. I can't hear you. Can you unmute? I wonder if, if he has to do it, because sometimes he locks. Roger, I think we need you. <laughs> and it always happens Roger. when he's not here. Okay, hold on one second. Let me try. <laughs> sometimes I can see it and do it, but sometimes. Okay, Rowena can't get unmuted, and she has a question. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> It always happens to me that I, I can't uh, because it's, it's and that's hard. why I always tell them, you know. So Rowena is over one for me. Oh, we're up there. Okay. There you ah. go. You found her. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was going to make a comment okay. on how good God is. Okay. Because when He made man and woman to be one. He was the great anesthesiologist. He put Adam to sleep. So there was no pain. Mm -hmm. But when God made us one with Christ, he had to go through the cross and all the pain that he had to receive in his body. Right. So. Right. Yes. Yeah, he was willing to endure the pain. Amazing. But, but a great, yes. Yes. And finishing our picture, bringing it all together, he has made her now, go back to Genesis 2, he has made her out of, out of Adam's side, he has formed her from the rib that he took from the man, and he brought her to the man. That's the picture of our future. When God's finished forming his bride, he'll bring her in rapture mm -hmm. to her bridegroom, Yeshua Jesus. Okay? Isn't that a beautiful thought? Okay. That pride is still being completed, still being formed by God. Let me show you where we come together as that, that bride comes to the bridegroom. Okay, oh, no wonder I can't get my tablet to work. It's there. 1 Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> this could be very familiar scriptures to you. It is our rapture scriptures. That would be from verses 13 to 18. Read that all and be blessed and encouraged and excited when you read it. But we'll focus just on 16 and 17 right now. And that says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the, and it says trumpet of God, and I believe that's the shofar. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Okay? Hold on to that thought to get the complete thought because I don't see the bride in here. I'm just being told that even if they've passed away already, but they died in faith in Yeshua Jesus, they're caught up, then we're caught up, we're all brought together to meet the Lord in the air to live always with the Lord. Now, with that in mind, go to 2 Corinthians 11, and we're going to look at verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, and we read there, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Oh, Paul's talking about um, those that he has brought to, to saving faith. Not that he saved them, but he introduced them and they received salvation. I'm jealous of you with, you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you. Betrothal. That's engagement. That's equal to marriage in the Hebrew. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Messiah, to Christ, I may present you as a pure virgin, as a bride should be a virgin for her bridegroom. Shaol Paul said, I've brought you in in that purity because you've been made pure in the blood of the Lord. I have brought you in to, to know a saving faith that through saving faith you can be presented to Messiah as your, his betrothal, his bride. That's what it's saying. And again, when you were betrothed, you were as good as married. If you wanted to break off a betrothal, you had to have a bill of divorcement. It was not something to be taken lightly. Follow that thought with me all the way to Revelation 19. 
verses 7 and 8, where it again speaks of us. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Okay. There we go. This time it worked. Revelation 19, 7. Let us rejoice. I am. I'm hallelujah. I am the Lord's bride. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And the bride has made herself ready. Okay, our Lamb, we know to be the Son of God. We know him to be the Son of Man. We know him to be Yeshua Jesus. We know this is just another name for him. We know him as Lamb all the way back. We'll see it. We won't get there today, I don't think. But No, we won't today. But Genesis 3.15, we're going to see the first. Actually, no, we'll see the first slight picture. But it will grow in, in chapter 3. We'll see it slightly in 2. Then in 3, we see it. You can follow the Lamb all the way through Scripture. You'll see it in Shemot, in Exodus. If you've been with me in Passover, you know the picture it is. Take it all the way to Yochanan John in the Lord's human days on this earth, living at the same time, seeing him come as he has now stepped into his ministry that he's going to do for three and a half years and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Lamb. We see this Lamb in Revelation 5. I, I, in heaven, at the right hand of God on the throne, he takes the, the title deed to the earth out of the hand of the Father because he has the right to the title deed. He bought it. He redeemed it by his blood. This is the lamb that we are seeing that's being referred to here. The lamb gets married. And then there's a marriage feast. Well, the marriage, we know, in essence, takes place when we get saved. We're going to come into the fullness of it getting all the benefits of it, and even being part of that marriage feast in a day to come. You know, your, your version, here, and it, when you were saying about uh, you know, being betrothed, um, my version, it says, a lamb has, uh, has come, and his wife. And his wife. Good, because it says, good as, 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 as good as, yes. Yeah. 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 I had to look in the he ancient Hebrew and see if they referred to, like we use the word fiance or fiance. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to look and see. I bet you anything there's no comparable there in Hebrew. I'll bet you it's wife because that's how she was looked at. Yeah, yeah. That's why when Yosef finds out that Miriam is pregnant, he's of a mind to put her away privately because he had the right to have her stoned to death because she belonged to him. He was the one that could have said, hey, she's done what she shouldn't have done. She deserves to be put to death because an adulteress would be put to death. So she, she, he could have done that, but he didn't. And, but my point being, she was like his wife, even though they had not consummated their marriage yet. And actually, don't consummate it in that way until after Yeshua is born. So that is obvious. It was virgin birth, and he was not created out of the seed of Yosef, but out of the seed of the Holy Spirit of God who encompassed her, who were also... I can't wait. We've got to keep moving in Genesis because I want to bring all this out. It's all pictured in Genesis. It is the great beginning. Yes. Oh, it's the great beginning. So much we get a picture. Back here, though, verse 8 before I give that up. The bride has made herself ready. How did she make herself ready? It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. Okay, she's been given her, her uh, bridal dress. What do you call it? Her wedding gown. Okay? Mm -hmm. Brides go and look all over, find that special gown, and they love that gown above all other gowns. It's beautiful to them. Well, guess what? You don't have to go shopping. You don't have to wear yourself out. The Lord is the one who dresses us. And sorry, men, but you're dressed in the gown too, so just forgive us. For, this is the female side, the mother love of the Father God, okay? So you're in it also because it tells us the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now we're told we can't do anything righteous in ourselves. That's Isaiah 64. It's also in Isaiah 61. Our righteousness apart from the Lord is as filthy rags. What we think is so great is filth in God's sight. How do we have righteousness in the shed blood, the torn side of the one who's birthed us and who's given us life the second time, the second Adam, and who brings us in as his bride, the same way Eve was given as a bride to Adam. This is the picture we're seeing. And just as a little side note, if our fine linen is a righteous acts, the things that we do in the power of the Lord after we're saved, 
as my mom said, some may be up there in mini skirts and some may be up there in flowing robes. Well, I don't know about you, but I want a flowing robe. So I want to do many righteous acts for the Lord in the power of his spirit. I want to be fully dressed. No mini skirts. No mini skirts. Not for me and not for any of you, I trust too. But that's our whole picture. Keep that picture in mind as we go back to Genesis. And I am watching our time, but I want to be able to finish this, this one thought. We'll pick it up really in a part two next week because there's just so much in it. But he's brought her to the man the same way God brings Messiah's bride to Messiah. We meet in the air. We go home into the, to his house to live forever with the Lord. Back in... in um, Bear sheet in Genesis, and we're ready for verse 23. The man, Adam, said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, easily in Hebrew, the woman and the man is ish for man, isha for woman. So it's just showing she came out of man, so her name reflects that, that she's part of man. Somebody once said that God, I mean, I'm sorry, that Adam took a look at, at his wife and went, Whoa, man! <laughs> <laughs> and there's your God made woman better than he made man. But jokes aside, that's what it's saying in our Hebrew. But let me go to that bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. He recognized that Chava, Eve, had the same physical flesh, had the same life type that Adam had. Remember, none of the other animals were suitable, were comparable, would be a help me, would be a completion, would fit together, would be a chad, would be that united one. But this, because she was directly created by God. Who else? Adam himself, directly created by God. So she was given to Adam by God. God made man and woman, and he gifted them to each other. And that made each one, because each was made in the image of God, each one was breathed into to come to life by God, that made each one capable of personal fellowship with God. Both equal, both able to have that personal fellowship, that personal relationship with God. And to explain that relationship, he brings it down to our marriage level, so let me give you, do I want to give you or do I want to put you on a hold right here? Uh, let me see how fast I can do it. And it keeps leading. It just keeps going. We have chapter breaks, but we shouldn't because it's just one complete story. Um, let me hit the, the highlights and bring you back for the depth, okay? The highlights we're going to see is that they're going to be taught about uh, cleaving together, joining together. We're going to see that they become this one flesh. I'll explain to you, you may have heard it before, but I'll explain to you in the Hebrew, the word for that one is the word echad. I'll explain why it had to be that word and not the other word. We'll see again how that's a picture of what we call the church, the body of Christ. It's, it's brought together in that oneness. We'll see it where we go from what, again, the, the completer and the helpmate, that we are not in the position when we're in our fullness of it and receiving the fullness of it. We're not in the position of a slave. Right now we are bond servants to the Lord. I'll bring that up. But we eventually are brought up to that level of bride, that level that, um, that, that brings us to that equality because the bride isn't lesser than the bridegroom. So we'll see all of that as we go into the Hebrew. The picture will, can, will be... Um, we'll be completing it. They will see that they were made in such a way that they reflected the glory of the Lord. We'll talk about that next week. Um, I'm trying to decide how much I tip my hand and where I don't, but uh, I'll just throw this question out. I think we'll get to it next week. After they sinned, how did they know they were naked? Good thought question. Think about it for the week. Mm -hmm. See what you come up with. I'll show you from the Hebrew. I'll show you again. I mean, there's so much picture in here, but the beautiful picture of the two cleaving together, becoming one flesh. That's why there is not an option for divorce in God's book. 
There is not a separation. God never divorces, or I should say Yeshua Jesus, never divorces his bride. His bride is always his bride. They've come together. They've completed. They've become one. They've become united. They've become echad. This is the beautiful picture. Not just that God created Adam and Chava in that way, but that God brings us into that kind of a oneness with him where we're literally brought up to a level that you're just going to go, wow, <laughs> I don't deserve that level, but look at the blessing that's mine. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what I'm referring to, there's a specific word, we get it out of the book of Romans, but we see it right here in Genesis. Come back for part two next week. There's just too much. It's 3.33. I'd have to take you a good little while to get you through this whole picture. So we'll renew and refresh but I encourage you, think on it this week. Go explore. Explore it in view of other scriptures that hopefully will be popping into your mind. And we'll see what, what an awesome God who didn't just create awesomely and wonderfully, but then took the human creation in his image and took that to a level to show us who he is and who our relationship with him is and how it continues forever. Just amazing. Just awesome. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm done. <laughs> Questions, comments? I just, I've got to stop my mind because I want to spit this out and that out and the other out. But I want us to be able to appreciate and enjoy it. So I think it's better to come back. We'll leave it in the midst. Part two coming. Any questions, comments, unmute yourselves. I hope you're feeling loved. I hope you're feeling wonderfully created. Yes, Dave. Um, you're muted. You're still muted. Can you help him? For Dave? Dave. In the middle. There we go. Oh, there it is. I'm, I'm clicking on my own picture trying to turn off the mirror. <laughs> anyway, when you were looking for uh, something to describe uh, man and woman uh, would the word complement each other because the definition of complement says that it's a noun, a thing that completes or brings to perfection. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, the only, the only thing is it wasn't that Adam was imperfect in the way we think of it today, but think of that in the prior because it did take the two to be the completeness because it took both to make the picture of God. Because either one alone don't. So yes, and what a compliment. And what a compliment. <laughs> Both ways. It compliments it, and it is a compliment. That's how great and how awesome our God is. And I am so thankful for the male attributes. I am so thankful for the female attributes in our awesome God. That, that we get to have all of that showered on us. Wow. Yeah, good, good definition, good way to put it. Thank you. Yes, Anne, and you're still muted, so unmute yourself. Don't poke on your picture, poke on the button. <laughs> there you go. Uh, next, next week when we review, uh, can you weave in Leviticus 17, 11? The life of the flesh oh. is in the blood? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. You wanting the, the more detail what that verse means with the Hebrew background or how it relates to Adam and Eve? And just be good to correlate it. I'd like to see it correlated with other points you made today, which it all seems to weave together. Okay. Because Leviticus 17 11 is the only verse that I know where um, when witnessing I'm challenged with why does there always have to be this issue of blood? Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, because and that's I'll, life. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. I'm done. Okay. I'm, I'm writing it down. So you want Leviticus 17:11 and the issue of why always has to be blood. Um, that's going to well, be very it, hard to do in a it, nutshell yeah, because that, you know without because without the, the blood there is no forgiveness. Right, of sin. which that verse clearly says. Maybe that's what I just need to do is take us through that verse uh -huh. and ex express it a little more um, 
I just did, and it took me two full messages to touch on the blood. And I see a third message already. <laughs> Y'all don't know that yet, but there's a part three coming. It just keeps blowing my mind. Mm. But there's so much on that. I'll try to maybe pull out the highlights of that and bring it in. But uh, um, yeah, also, uh, you know, because blood was needed for for, for, the, for the forgiveness of sins before Jesus uh, came, but He was the ultimate. Yes. Sacrifice. Yes. That. That perfect plan. That the per perfect exactly. Uh, yeah. So yeah. there is no more uh, shedding of the blood is needed because that right. was the, the the perfect. Right. That's why in our new form, when we are in our resurrected bodies, we are flesh and bone. We are not flesh and blood and bone. Mm -hmm. We are flesh and bone in that body that lives forever eternally with the Lord. And I'm reminded at the same time by Maria's words. Remember when we looked back about the uniqueness of being made in God's image that he knew he was going to take on human form. So when he created human form, he created it in a way to be able to enter into that human form with his God-like qualities that make him who he is so that he could be fully God and fully man at the same time. Because were he not, he would not be able to redeem mankind. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't redeem mankind by, by entering into the body of just a lamb. It was, it was more than that. And he couldn't, by entering into anything else, he had to, to save human flesh, it had to be a human. The lambs were only a picture. The lamb didn't save. Sin wasn't washed away until the cross. It, it, here we go again. It's the blood. It's wow, wow. And you're going to see that. You're going to see that in chapter two. You're going to see it in chapter three. I was studying in chapter three. Three fifteen is the first messianic prophecy in scripture. So obviously, with my Jewish background, I've spent much time in that verse and shared that many times, along with Leviticus seventeen eleven. Those are two huge verses that we share when we're trying to help our Jewish people understand from their background. And it was just exploding. It's like, how do you keep showing me more, God? How do they, there's just so much more. I can't wait to get us to 3.15. As I was studying, I just wanted to catapult us there and then come back. <laughs> but I'll confuse you if I take you all over the place. You know, we've got to go in order. And I have to realize, too, he's built me to that point in my study up to that point. The orderliness of Scripture. You know, Genesis gives us the very beginning. That's why it's put in the very beginning. And when we see what God did in the first human flesh, we have to have that to ignite. But then we've got to remember, you know, this is laying the groundwork. Remember how Dr. McGee said it? All the trains go out in Genesis. They all come back in Revelation. Everything in between is... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes we can follow the, the thread. Like when I gave you the scarlet thread through Scripture, which is the blood... Sometimes, you know, we see a trail, sometimes we, we don't, or not in every book. But it, it just blows my mind and how God chose the orderliness of Scripture. Like, I'm thinking now, I want to jump all over the page and I have to try to figure the best way to put it in order so that we follow and develop our thoughts. God did that with the Scripture. He saw to it that the Scripture's in the order it's in for the development and the following of our thoughts. We can't jump into Revelation and understand without having Genesis. Mm -hmm. We can't, you know, we it just, this is where we have to start. And why I was so anxious to teach this book, because I want it to be alive. I want it to be palpable. I want it to be real people that, that when we get into the Bible characters, I want them to be real people. I want you to meet these people face to face and, and feel like you're getting to know them. But at the same time, what a book to introduce you to all oh, the first picture salvation mm. the first picture of love the first picture of life you know and, and, and if you see like uh, Genesis and, and Revelation you know they, they complement each other absolutely they do in between we get all these things to get to the point yes 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 it, it, it is the beginning and the end but there's so much depth in between. It's amazing. Our God is amazing. And I laugh because I know very well, and I hear the Lord saying it. Yeah, Rochelle, 
but you're still on just a, a, a preschool level. Wait till you get home and you get that mind that can really wow. comprehend. You're going to look back and say, wow, we thought we were grabbing this. We thought we were getting a handle. And it's like my little three-year-old thinking I can run the household. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't mind being a three-year-old in God's school, but I do say, grow me up, God, grow me up. Yeah. <laughs> I want it all. I want it all. Uh, John Corson. Yeah, uh, let me share something. Yes, uh, ma'am, go ahead. I'll shut up. Yeah, yeah. Let me share the testimony. Sure. Now, before I had my menopause, I had one month, more than a month, bleeding. It's bleeding. And I said, I went to the Abigaini. I went in. Uh, he examined me and advised me to have, oh, I don't, DNC, but I said, no, 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 no doc, I'm going to ask the Lord, I'll, I'll seek the Lord first. So the first scripture that came to my mind is that widow who was trying to touch the hand of Jesus' garment, so I, I, I meditate on that, then Another one, one time I was, I was reading the Bible, I came to that verse, that life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. Lord, I have, I have wasted so much blood. But your word says here, the life is in the blood, but you, are, you, will, you will be able to heal me. <laughs> you will restore those lost blood. And I said, Lord, uh, and the Lord really did it. Without, without any medicine, without any operation, without anything, but the Lord really restored that <laughs> to good health. Praise oh, the Lord. So you see, that verse really is so, so significant to me. That it life is. is in the blood. Amen. And, <laughs> and also, uh, um, there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Right. So, right. you know, yeah, I, all, I meditate on all those words and I said, Lord, show me what am I going to do. And so he, that's and it. He, and we he, can hold on to God's word. Beautiful. And he guided, he touched, and he healed. And it reminds me, I didn't pray for you in the beginning. The kidneys, yeah. they cleanse yeah. the blood. So may the Lord again restore to you all that you need Amen. at this point in time. Amen. And my apology for overlooking. And I'm reminded by Anne's question also, the blood is a um, trigger, a trip, a tripwire, a tripwire for Jewish people. They do not like to think that blood has to be shed. They do not like to think that someone had to give life for them to have life. This, this is, they want to, I'm a good person and I'll, I'll do good works. And I'm, very many of your philanthropists are Jewish because they do want to bless and they do want to help others. And they're taught that. So this is a real stickling point when we're sharing with them. And honestly, it is hurtful. I do shrink back from it. I've never been able to watch the, the um, when they do the life of Yeshua, I've never been able to watch without shielding my yeah. eyes at some point. I can't <laughs> handle that part, but I'm so mm -hmm. thankful for that part. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I will appreciate what you're saying, Anne, and I will ask the Lord to give me yeah. divine guidance as to how to tie it in with this and give you what you can use in your ministry to the Jewish people that the Lord's been opening even a greater door for you to do. So, um, very timely, but yes, it's, uh, Amen. It, it is the blood, whether we like it or not, it is. It's the high cost. You know, our salvation, it, it, we say it's priceless, and it is, but it came at a cost. It cost the Lord everything. It cost him his life. And then to think that there are those who will trample that underfoot, it's heartbreaking. We told him because we haven't been taught. And the eyes be open. And, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll drop this on you. Forgive me for stealing time back because it should be your time. But just before class, my heart was yeah. broken. And if you saw me fumbling in the beginning of this class, it was because I was asking the Lord to put me back together. My dad started a witness of this truth of Yeshua Jesus being Messiah and Savior to a man named Eddie in either 1957 or 1959. I have been given the privilege of carrying it on to this day. Roger's been with me. I've asked prayer many times for 99-year-old Eddie. I'm sorry. He's not going to turn 100. 
He passed away Monday. Oh, wow. He did? When? Monday. And I just got work before class. If this life-giving blood isn't just shouting out, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your family, Dosi, by God's wisdom, get in the face of that one who is an atheist. And I've got one that I hope is hearing even now. This is the truth. This is life. This is for eternity. You're going to spend it either in suffering and torment, or you're going to spend it in love and glory. And it's your choice, but it all is from the blood. You either accept or you reject the blood that was shed in your place. I can only hope that Eddie did in the last moments of his life. I know he knew. I know he knew how. I know the testimony had been given to him a hundred times, probably more than that, between starting with my dad, second generation here, friends that were caretakers for him. I can only hope, but it, it shook me to my core. What I had to close off and what's opening up right now is I don't know where he is. I don't know if he's suffering and I don't know if he walked into the presence of his Messiah and Savior and my dad got to throw his arms around him and say, come on in, Eddie, and okay. welcome him home. I, I hope and I will yeah. hold on to that hope till I'm home and I find out. But if it doesn't make me realize no one's guaranteed another day. He was doing great. He was 99 with full faculties. He had a few little health issues, nothing that would compromise him to that degree. He did, um, I don't remember what started, but he ended up with pneumonia. He was in the hospital, um, and his heart just gave up. He was, they thought he was going to come home next week, and instead his heart just stopped. Um, and at his age, I, you know, I'm sure his heart was worn out. The heart pumps the blood. It's all about the blood. And it just makes me realize, you know, I mean, the last time I was with Eddie, Roger there too, he's part of this. But the last time, Eddie and I lovingly got into it. We had our little, you know, going back and forth. And I left him with one of my dad's messages because he loved my dad. And, you know, I encouraged him, even though he'd had it before, I encouraged him. And if I remember right, I think it was on the blood atonement. I think that's the one that I left. Very interesting. But uh, we just, we can't take a chance that you'll see someone another time. You've got to share. If the Lord puts it on your heart, I'm not telling any of you, shove it down somebody's throat. Because no one receives the Lord that way. No one wants that. But I am telling you, if you feel the tug of the spirit to speak. Don't be afraid. Don't think I can't do it. You know, we need so-and-so to do it. No, the Holy Spirit in you is the one who'll give you the words. And uh, like I say, I hope someone's hearing even right now. I have to say that carefully, but I'm going to say it because I care. And I'm not going to take that chance. So I think, you know, um, and that's one of the things that the Lord gives us um, that that you give to give him that and I, I think you know there is things that uh, things that the, the Lord has not allowed us to to know and uh, the secrets of the Lord mm -hmm. and I always run into that because yes. that gives me comfort yes. Yes. knowing that he knows yes and he knows the heart exactly. we look at the outside someone can put on a facade and you can say that person saved and their heart's far away from God and vice versa. Eddie was full of pride. He was very proud of himself. That pride could have kept him from telling us, I receive, until he would have grown in the Lord, and the Lord would have helped him with that pride. But it, it easily could have kept us. And I did say that. I said, my only consolation and my only hope is, Lord, you knew his heart. You knew his heart. And you're not willing that any would perish. So I have even the fact that God kept a witness going to him says that God never said he had sinned away his day of salvation. Only God can do that. Only God can close the door. We never can take that decision on our own. 
I can only hope because I know even in the last few days, going just prior to the 14th, someone and was talking with me, we hadn't talked in a while, they are very much prayer supporters of, of my ministry. And they asked me who, you know, to be praying for, and I brought Eddie up. And the text came, and this, this is prior to February 14th, the text came, we're praying every day for the salvation of 99-year-old Eddie. Mm. Right up to the end, God was putting it on people's hearts. That gives me great hope. Mm -hmm. It gives me great hope. But uh, it is. It's all about the blood, whether they like it or not. And like I say, when you've created and you've made your world, you can make your rules. Until you've done that, you're living in a world that God created, and he gets to set the rules. And he set them in such love. And then he fulfilled them. He wrote it in love. Amen. Amen. And that's why I understand Lorna and her heartburn for family to hear on that Monday. And why we keep praying and keep talking and keep that hope. Are you going to close us in prayer? I should, shouldn't I? I'm sorry. I think, I think I'm is. sorry. Yeah, and it is time. I, I know some here need to go, and they'll walk across, so we will, but we'll open up mics again, too. But let's, let's do it. Let's close in prayer. Our precious, precious Abba, Father, Yeshua Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man, how thankful we are for that ship. How thankful we are for the picture that you show us that, that as you brought Chava, life, out of Adam's side, that you brought us life out of your side. And we are so thankful. We know we could never merit that. We yes. could ne never in a million years and with everything within our power. But you freely gave it. And Lord, we are thankful. And out of that thankful heart, may we speak. Give us words, give us wisdom with those words. Give us opportunity, Lord, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Ruch HaKodesh, may we share this life message with those near and far. Lord, we pray that any who hear this recording who are not within the family or any who have heard it live who are not within the family, who are not part of the bride, that they would open up their hearts open their eyes to see it, their ears to hear it, let their hearts receive it, Lord, because you're not willing that any should perish. You died for them as if they were the only one on the face of this earth. Lord, we, we just want this message to go in your power and to bring life to those in need. Lord, you've given us the privilege of being the conduit to share that. So especially in the days and the weeks to come, we pray for opportunity and for it, your voice to speak, your words to be said, and those hearts that are part of, of those who you know will receive will be the ones in our path that we will have the joy of seeing them come into birth, that new birth of life which will be abundant and eternal with you forever. Thank you that it's ours forever and we know it. And Lord, we are anxious to go home and to be with you but let us stay a day longer to bring one more with us. This is our heart's cry, Lord. Let all of Israel and let all of the nations hear and know and be saved by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, Seha Elohim, Lamb of God, thank you. Thank you. In your holy name, amen. Amen.